you can have a look at this in your in your own time if you like. But there's remarkable similarities between Second Peter chapter two and the Epistle of Jude. And the question is, which one was written first? Was somebody copying somebody else? Or were they writing at the same time? And to do that, we can have a look. There's a simple way um, we can prove which one came first. If you come to our reading of Second Peter, chapter 2, we'll read in verse, verse 1. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers amongst you. Verse 2, and many shall follow pernicious ways by reason of whom the the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Verse 3, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of sex in merchandise of you. And then we'll just go over to Jude and we'll pick up just another three words in there which relate to those three that we've just read. And those are, verse 4, for there are certain men crept in unawares. Verse 12, these are spots in your feasts. Verse 19, these be they. So the situation we have is that Peter is warning of a problem that is coming along, and we're going to talk exactly about what this problem is. But when you get to Jude, he says, it's here. And there's something significant about that that we need to have a little bit of a takeaway for we have, we know that Peter died in uh, 64 AD. The Epistle of Jude, taking a snapshot of some of the best scholars, those who are, are putting up good arguments for the, the conclusions they've come to. Jude was written around 75 AD. Now, if Brother Paul got up next week and said, there will be something going to happen in Canterbury Ecclesia, how long do you reckon it's going to take? That, at my reckoning, is about 11 years. You have Sunday school kids here younger than that. That's the seriousness of what this message is. Don't worry, I'll get lighthearted in a minute. But... The point that we're making here is that in between all of this on the left and all of this on the right, something had gone downhill. And I don't know, um, in your Bibles, in your Bible day, you've got a microphone. What does it say at the start of Jude? Start of Jude. What's the title of Jude? Read out the first one. Not the title. The title? Sure. Well, the first title that I come across is the sin and doom of godless men. Okay, I'm looking for another version. No, no, right at the top. Right at the top. What have you got? The letter of Jude? The letter of? The epistle of? Some have Jude. <laughs> I'm glad we're on the right subject anyway. Some, all right, he's just got Jude. Yeah, just Jude again. Epistle of Jude. The other one is the general epistle of Jude. And I want to show you tonight that I don't believe that to be the case. Jude's writing to someone or some ecclesia very specifically. I spoke with a brother just in talking about this, and he thinks it's Corinthians, and I think it's somebody else, and I'll, I'll show, I'm going to show you who that is. And when we put a lot of these things together, you'll find that there is a specific timeline that's happening. I've put up two here. There's going to be a couple couple more. (laughs) All right. So who did you write to? We've got a a couple of examples here. This is going to help. I'll, I'll start here instead. 
In Jude, we've got these, there's at least three notorious passages that are difficult to explain. We've got the angels who are imprisoned in the earth. We've got the contest over the body of Moses with uh, Michael the archangel. And these are, I've, I've deliberately printed out Jude here so you don't have to keep flicking back and forward if we have to do that. On the right hand side, you're free to make your notes and you can keep your pens. And then the third one is this book of Enoch. Now, confession time. Who put me up to this? I didn't. James, was it? Yeah, that would be right. He's not here. Asher. <laughs> Did he? No, no. Yeah. Who gave me it? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah, but they get suggestions and put them in, so I'm, I'm just wondering how, how, how they got me with it. <laughs> That's okay. We've had some fun learning. There isn't. I'm going to give you three little, three quick little things here. There is no apocrypha in Jude. The second one is this key word. All right? And I've, I've given you a little key on your worksheets there. Once you've got this word, you've not just got a little bit of Jude. This key unlocks the whole chapter. In fact, it unlocks the entire first epistle of Jude from chapter 1 until the end. And that word is angels. Right? And this, does, this, this, this word does not just affect some of these verses where it says angels in it. It affects the whole book. And I'll show you why in a minute. Because... Once you understand that Jude is always about angels and not just angels per se, but a problem with angels. And Jude says, enough. I'm going to fix this problem because the problem was the worshipping of angels. And the ecclesia that Jude is writing this epistle to had a problem worshipping angels. And Jude is very clever. It might just seem that there's sections and he meanders off onto this or that. But Jude has come up with a very specific way of dealing with this problem of angel worship. And that is a word that sort of goes with angels as our key word, and that is the word judgment. Now, judgment is the soft underbelly of the worshipping of angels. Because, and, and this is what Jude goes after, and he uses every trick in the book to do it. Because he does not want this pernicious, sneaky doctrine coming into this particular ecclesia. Now, I'll go to the next one. I'll show you what's going on here. All right, we're going to look at this. This is written by um, Epiphanius, and he is around 360 AD. He writes, Angelici, a heretical sect of the 3rd century, supposed to have gained the appellation in consequence of their Worship of angels. The practice was imitated in the time of uh, Chrysostom and called forth his animate versions in his homilies on the Colossians. And you don't want to get an animate version from Chrysostom. You can go on reading there, uh, and th this is particularly the Council of Laodicea, is where they got stuck into them and said, no, nah, you can't do that anymore, get that out of here. Christians ought not to uh, forsake the church of God and go aside and hold conventicles or invocate or call upon the names of angels, which things are forbidden. If anyone therefore be found to exercise himself in this private idolatry, let him be accursed because he has forsaken our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and gone over 
to idolatry. Catholics saying we don't like this. And I agree with them. I don't agree with the reason why. Because they didn't want them worshipping angels because there's no money in angels. There's money in relics and icons and saints. So they wanted to knock this out. Now what had happened is that there's actually a historical reason why there was angel worship in Colossae. In about 250, maybe 260 BC, a man by the name of Antiochus, who was king of the Seleucid Empire, you heard of Antiochus Epiphanes? This is his dad. Okay? This is his dad. And he had some civil unrest in the far side of his empire. I'll just do a mud map here. You've got Greece, um, Turkey, there's a little creek through there, and then you know, down to Egypt and Israel in here, etc. Um, and the Seleucid Empire was right around here. And it included the likes of Babylon and Susa and everything else. But up here, where these ecclesias were up here, there was a lot of stuff going on up there, and there was a bit of trouble. So. Antiochus says, well, I've got an idea. I'm going to get 2,000 Hebrew or Jewish families and I'm going to move them from Babylon and I'm going to put them up here. And he put them in Colossae. Now, these were not your average Torah-nodding, temple-worshipping, animal sacrificing kind of Jews. They were there in Babylon for 70 years at last count. Antiochus moves them about 140, 150 years later. So these are, these are Jews who've decided not to go back to the land of Israel. They're happy where they are. They're enjoying Babylon. There's money to be made. There's friends to be made. There's trade to be had. There's goods to be sold. There's a lifestyle to be had. And so they left a lot of these other things and came up with some things like the Book of Enoch and other ideas, all inspired by Babylonish worship of their gods. And so Antiochus takes them all the way over there and he puts 2,000 families in Colossae. Colossae wasn't like Melbourne, not millions and millions of people. He probably had 10,000 people, maybe 20,000 people. But you bring in 2,000 families, not 2,000 people, 2,000 families. You imagine what is happening in that city at that time. In a way, it's quite a smart move by Antiochus because he gets to settle that down and say, okay, well, there's some trade stuff going on there. There's some educated Babylonian exposed people there. And so Colossae is where all these people move. And they bring these doctrines with them. And tie this in with something else. Have a look at this. Next time you read this, Think about the order the letter to the seven ecclesias was written. This is why it is. You've got Patmos here. First stop, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Laodicea was well known, of course, for their being, their being what? Lukewarm? Tepid, right? And they had a, they had a spring, a hot spring outside the city, about four or five hundred metres outside the city, and they used to bring it into the town, and by the time it got there, it was lukewarm. It was, it was well known for its lukewarm water. Lukewarm water, you can't do anything with it. You've either got to heat it up or you've got to cool it down. Something else is missing off here is about where this little marker is here is glossy. 
Jesus says, send this to the seven ecclesias in Asia. And this was John writing on Patmos. Uh, 95, 96, take your pick. Peter says, look out. Jude says, there's trouble in town. And Jesus Christ says, I ain't even bothered going to write you. That's what happened. And so this is the structure of Jude. This is what Jude's dealing with when he's writing to this. It could have been another ecclesia. I'm just putting together the most likely scenario. And when you put it together with all this other history, there's really very, very few other options. I'm not going to be tempted to use the word dogmatic. So we'll just go over here and we'll have a look at the Apocrypha. What I want, I don't want to do a verse by verse of Jude. What I want to do is give you the tools to open Jude at any time and you can all get up and explain it to anybody of any age or any experience. This is the Apocrypha. These came in, they were actually published in, in an earlier Bible. And the Apocrypha is made up of these particular books. And they are known as Deuterocanonical books. Right? Deutero. Duet means two. So this is second, and canon is another is another. It's, it's a good word to know. Canon is rule or measure. It's not a big gun, all right? It's a rule or a measure. I'll put rule. These books here were second rule books. They were second tier down. Um, incidentally, Deuteronomy, was it the second book of Moses? No, it, our, our word Deuteronomy actually comes from a mistake that was made when they translated the Septuagint. And it comes from, uh, I think it's chapter 17, uh, you'll know the quote where it says, um, when you have a king, you'll write it down, you'll, you'll copy this law down again. And when the Greeks translated that, they translated copy as second. You will make a second law. So it wasn't the, the first law. The Hebrews, even today, call Deuteronomy Elaha Davim, which simply means these are the words, which is what Deuteronomy opens with. Um, and to shorten it, they just call it Davim. There's another Deutero thing you can have a look at. Okay, so these... These here are considered second rate to our 66 books. This lot are considered second rate. There might be a little bit of merit in them. They might have a few interesting stories. Some of them might fit in and make sense. Some of them actually copy the ends of other books that are in the Bible. So that is the Apocrypha, and there's nothing in any of these books that have anything to do with Jude. The next lot do. <laughs> These are the books of a pseudepigrapher. Okay? Lots of big words, don't fuss. All right? You can write them down and look them up later. Pseudepigrapher simply means with false title. So it's a book that is written by somebody saying, you know, Judy wrote a book. Um, but it was really Sid who wrote the book for Judy. Judy's name's on it, but it's not really the title of the book. It should be the book of Sid. You understand? A lot of these are very spurious, and you'll notice here we have the book of Enoch. Okay? That's what does come up in Jude. And later on, it's not in the book of Jude, but I'm going to refer to the book of Jasher very briefly by way of an example. So we have the canon of scripture, we have the apocrypha, we have the pseudepigrapha, and then we've got another lot. <laughs> These are called the lost books of the Bible. 
And pretty much the reason they were lost is because they probably shouldn't have been written in the first place, and it's a good thing they're lost. All right. This one uh, right at the top, I put it at the top because it's going to be easy to find. Uh, the Gospel of the Birth of Mary, and uh, goodness sake, uh, letters of Herod and Pilate. You know, there's absolutely nothing inspired about any of these books. The top one we are going to refer to because there's a tiny, 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 tiny little bit of that in Jude. Before I go on to the next bit, has anybody got any questions about this? Is any things sparked up? Go, eh, that jars, or I'm, I'm not quite sure of that. A lot of them were. Some of them, like the Gospel of Barnabas um, and things like that, uh, the Epistle of Ignatius to, to the Ephesians and this sort of thing, that would be quite some. About two hundred years, uh, two hundred years later. No, it's actually thought some the pseudepigrapha. Some of it can be, but pseudepigrapha is almost. If you look at it there, the books of Adam and Eve, it could have been written Old Testament time, but Enoch is definitely Old Testament time, but it got added to as it went along. But, you know, letter to the Smyrnans, you know, the gospel of the Savior's infancy and that sort of thing are definitely have to be New Testament times. The pseudepigraph has never been collated. It's just a name for this lot of books. It was really only the Apocrypha that was ever collated and put in a book. So, and it was in the, in the Geneva Bible, the, these appeared in the Geneva Bible. But they were named as Apocrypha. When it came to the very first KJV, they were put in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But they sort of said, these are books that have some kind of merit, but be careful of them, sort of thing. So what we're trying to do, what we kind of come up with here when we go through these, is that we've got all this incredible body of work, but who says what's true? You know, it's a problem for us, isn't it? That we, somebody says, well, how do I, you convince me that your Bible's true. You've got all these things here. Particularly if you've got um, someone, I don't know if Brother Paul still will back me up on this, but if you know some Jewish families, a lot of them have read the book of Enoch. When we were talking to someone last Wednesday night after class, and they, they happened to be um, a Jewish guy there, and he just started talking about the book of Enoch before we said anything, and we just, they know about it. What makes our Bible so special? And who decides what's in it and what's not in it? Answering these questions helps us to answer all the questions we have as we go through Jude. There are five key or five main things that we consider when we look at the Bible as the inspired word of God. These are them here. Was the book written by a spokesman of God? Was the writer confirmed by the acts of God? Did the message tell the truth about God? Does it come with the power of God? And finally, was it accepted by the people of God? I could go through and compare all of these pseudepigrapha and other books and everything else. I'm just going to pick one because it comes up in Jude, um, in verse 14, yep, and when he's quoting Enoch, okay? I've read the book of Enoch. It's entertaining. <laughs> um, and it's very, very interesting, but it's clearly not inspired. So I'm going to use, I'm going to use a couple of sections out of Enoch to give you an example of why, when we apply these things to our Bible, we, we have a really good basis for our conviction that this is the Word of God. The first one. This is taken from Enoch. And the Most High, Holy One, and Great Spake to Uriel, that's an angel, to the son of Lamech, and said to him, Go to Noah and tell him in my name, Hide thyself. That's not what God said in the Bible. He said, 
all God said to himself to Noah, he didn't send somebody else. He might have had an angel, but he didn't send that angel without his word. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And he didn't hide himself. He prepared an ark for the saving of his house. So that is written by a spokesman of God, who in this case was Moses, because he wrote Genesis. The second one. These are the names of the holy angels who watch, etc., etc. Raguel, one of the holy angels who takes vengeance on the world of the luminaries, is not what the Bible says. The Bible says, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs. And again in Hebrews, for he has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense. It's not the job of angels. And there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication. Samyaza taught enchantments. Barakijal taught astrology. Right? These are angels who are supposed to have left heaven and come down and caused havoc. That's not the truth about God. There shall not be found, these are the words directly of God through Moses, there shall not be found among you anyone that uses divination, no enchanters, charmers, wizards, familiar spirits, anything like that. And in fact, Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. That's truth. The power of God, he has created and given the power, given to man the power of understanding um, and power over the angels, all these bad angels. God commanded light shine out of darkness to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Lord ruleth over all. Bless the Lord ye, his angels that excel, excel in strength and do his commandments hearkening unto the voice of his word. There is no room for a doctrine that says angels rebelled against God, came down to earth, caused a whole lot of havoc, and then somebody came along and wrote a book about them. It's just not on. This is the, this, this doctrine that had come into this ecclesia. It shouldn't have been there. Again, look at this one. Goodness me. Was it accepted by the people of God? These are the chief of the angels. The fourth of them was named Penemur. He taught all the secrets of their wisdom and instructed mankind in writing with ink and paper. Men were not created for such a purpose to give confirmation to their good faith with pen and ink. That's not true. The Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. No prophecy of scriptures, any any in private interpretation, for the prophecy came not of old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And I'll just read this out for those who might be listening online. Thus, so far we learn that the book of Enoch was published before the Christian era by some great unknown Semitic race, uh, who believing himself to be inspired in a post-prophetic age, borrowed the name of an antediluvian patriarch, Enoch, to authenticate his own enthusiastic forecast of the Messianic kingdom. And that is written, this is a quote from Bishop, Archbishop Lawrence, who was a, a Book of Enoch expert. He translated it. As well as that, there's many problems with the Book of Enoch. I'm building this, I'm getting to a point here. But look at these. And they took wives, cohabited, conceived and brought forth giants whose stature was each 300 cubits. You know in the, in the South Bank where the casino is, the, the Crown Tower, that's 300 cubits. And there are a lot of them. And they ate everybody out of house and home. No, they didn't. They didn't exist. It's pure fantasy. This one, you know, I'm picking out some of it. But you from the beginning, this is the angels who were supposed to have left heaven and come down, 
messed up what mankind was doing and then got chucked in the ground, right? Talking to them. But you from the beginning were made spiritual, possessing a life which is eternal. So now we've got spiritual, eternal, sinning angels. You reckon God's going to put up with that? I don't think so. Therefore, I made not wise for you, because being spiritual, your dwelling supposed to be in heaven. Now the giants, who have been born of spirit and of flesh, shall be called upon the earth evil spirits, because they're born of spirit and flesh. Christ was born of spirit and flesh. The spirit acted, and Mary, who was flesh, brought forth, not an evil spirit, she brought forth the Son of God. That's particularly, or that's all that's bordering on blasphemy to me. Evil spirits shall proceed from their flesh because they are created from above. Other problems. I'm not going to go through all of them. It doesn't take that long to read the book of Enoch if you want to have a read of it. It's a good read. There's probably better things to read, but if you want to understand it, it's, it's not that hard. Uh, to get a hold of it and read it. Angels instruct mankind on weapon making. Moses said that there was a certain man who instructed, uh, and, and then they began to make weapons, etc. I think it was uh, Genesis 6, something like that. Lame, no, it wasn't Lame, it was someone else. Uh, they, teach, they teach sorcery and astrology. Angels multiply transgression. That goes directly about against what our our understanding of how sin comes about. The treatment of women in the book of Enoch is quite dreadful. I mean, if we take our Bible and you take you take all the guys in the Bible and you put all the good ones on one side and you put all the bad ones on the other side and then you work out the percentage you'll get a number. And if you take all the bad women in the Bible and you put them on one side, and you take all the good women in the Bible and put them on the other side, the percentage is higher on the good women's side than it would be on the men's side. Women are treated very fairly and particularly compared to, say, the likes of the Book of Enoch, the Quran, and anything else. Big problems with that. Men are to be punished for angels' sins and angels punished for men's sins. That's not fair. And then you've got predestination, etc. All right, I don't want to talk all about Enoch. The question is, it's not just this one incident. Jude is using all of these quotes here come from the book of Enoch. Jude knew the book of Enoch very well to be able to write this epistle. So it's not just... Can you see why I've said now, when you understand angels, you're going to understand the entire book of Jude. It's not just one little verse here and there. It's the entire book of Jude, because there is so much that um, that Jude is using. What he does, he does cleverly. Why is he quoting the book of Enoch? So what we're, what we're saying, so this is kind of a conundrum for us, because in they uh, someone asks you. Someone asks you a question on. Uh, so a couple of problems in Jude. And everybody goes rushing for the rest of the scriptures, <laughs> right? <laughs> How do I sort this out? How do I reconcile this? And there's a lot of good answers in, in uh, rest of scriptures, but <laughs> and it gives you a very good foundation uh, for how to answer these things and deal with them. But there's an even simpler one, and it goes back to that second word that uh, of our key words which was judgment. Jude says, all right, you're going to quote that. I'm going to use it against you. I took mum to the footy last weekend. I didn't really, but it's a good story. And she leaned across the fence at a particularly bad decision and said, you fluoro flea. Even the umpire's manual tells you that should have been a free. She doesn't carry the umpire's manual around. She never read it. Probably doesn't know what's in it. But she's using it against them. And that's what Jude's doing. He's saying, you want to quote Enoch at me? I'll quote Enoch back at you. And I'll tell you there's a problem with your book of Enoch. And that's this. 
Angels don't judge. That's the weak point in the argument about angel worshipping. Angels don't judge. And he goes on with a few that I'll show you in a minute. Hopefully I'll just get through this bit quickly. And then I'll go and give you these, these examples which are there. They're on that piece of paper in front of you where he uses incidents of where angels could have judged but don't judge. Now, if you can't judge, why should you be worshipped? Does Jesus judge? Does God judge? Does the Holy Spirit judge? No. Holy Spirit can't make decisions. Do angels judge? No. They do the will of God. So Paul, uh, so Jude goes in after this argument and says, why are you worshipping something that can't actually make a decision for right or for wrong on your behalf? And he uses this argument right through the book of Jude. So Jude's about angels, and it's also about this word judgment. And he uses it cleverly time after time after time to knock out any argument that could possibly be brought to him by, we perhaps believe the Colossians, that this is rubbish, get back to worshipping the true God. Okay? So there's no problem with Jude quoting Enoch or anybody else because he's using it to highlight the weaknesses in their understanding, the weaknesses in their argument, and to turn them back to those things that will work. I'll just run through a couple of quick ones here because Jude didn't start this. Somebody else did. Recognize this one. Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt. Words of Jesus. Quoting somebody 400 years earlier. Gold is the child of Zeus. Neither moth nor rust can devour it. We get, don't we? We in our language get things that we, uh, things that we, uh, say that are a part of our vocabulary that enter into our language every day. Some of them are funny. Some of them are normal. I can go, the return of Christ, to be or not to be. Wasn't in the Bible. Was it? Auntie Shirley answered the phone the other day and said, uh, what's up, Doc? <laughs> and everybody's not thinking about Jeff, they're thinking about carrots. All right? You're quoting these things that have come into the language. They're a part of our language. All right? They're not a part of our Bible and everything else, but we understand what they mean and what they are. Next one. Who said this, Paul? For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets, plural. Yes? Who said the second part? Erastus. David was talking, was it Titus or somebody, somebody was talking about Titus? Were you talking about Titus the other week? Quoting Eponides? Yeah. Well, that ver the, one of the verse, that top verse, for in thee, Zeus. Paul's quoting, <laughs> can you see? You want another one? Evil communications corrupt good manners. This is from a play. This is from something from the theatre. Bad company corrupts good character. Uh, it's, Theus is the play um, written by Meander and he borrowed it from Euripides, another playwright. All right, you want another one? This is, this is one Dave had the other week, yep. We know where that one came from. That was Epimenides again. So in the New Testament, we've got a lot of these quotes being used by people, you know, apostles and, that we regard and value and everything else. They are using the language of their day. They didn't have television. They had books. They read books. They quoted books. They talked about books. Or well, roles, really, but... Okay, this is a good one. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these who resist, etc., etc. Paul to Timothy. You ever remember those two names? Back in Genesis uh, or Exodus? Not there. 
That's where they come from. And when they had gone, uh, Moses and Aaron had gone, Pharaoh sent for Balaam the magician. Balaam's suddenly down in Egypt now. Gets around this fella. And to Janus and Jambres his sons, and to all the magicians they sat before the king. It's a book of Jasha. That's Pseudepigrapha. It's all part of the language that's being used. And here we have here, this is our Jude quote. Chapter 2 I have put there. And it's word for word. Now what you find here is, look what he's doing. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Right? Behold, he, the Lord, comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. The angel's going to kind of come and do it. God is going to come and do it. And even your false book of Enoch tells us that God's going to do it. So stop bowing down and worshipping angels. Come over just quickly. There's two quotes I'll show you. Um, let's go to Colossians, because I want to show you this, this one is here. Colossians chapter 2. I haven't got a lot of quotes for you tonight, but this one's worth looking at. Colossians chapter 2, I think it's verse 17. 18 will do. Let no man beguile you, and this is again language that we found in Jude and in Peter about these people sneaking in. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. That's pretending to be humble. And worshipping of angels, intruding into those things he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by the flesh of his mind. So there's a quote that Paul's directed to the Colossians precisely not to worship angels which is sort of another, it's another plank in our argument as to where, who this epistle of Jude was written to. And there's one more little interesting one that you should take a note of as well. In Revelation chapter 22, and this is where an angel himself says how things ought to be. Revelation chapter 22, we'll read from verse 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down and worshipped before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then said he unto thee, See thou do it not. For I am a fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So we have very clear understanding of what the problem was and we also have a very clear understanding of how it should be dealt with. Right, that's the end of that. Now, one minute, so I'm going to give you one example. Of eternal fire. Right. Now, where were the angels, and you'll find angels in every single example that um, Jude gives, where were the angels in the story of Lot? They went to rescue them, and they went into town, and whose house did they go to? They went to Lot's house, and a whole bunch of pretty nasty, twisted characters come alongside, uh, come up, and they said, uh, we want to abuse these people who have walked into your house. And the angels walked out and said, no, you can't. No, they didn't, did they? Who came out? Lot. You would expect an angel to come out and go, no, the angels didn't judge. Righteous Lot judged. It wasn't the angels who would judge. So you see why he picks that example? Now this is found over in Zechariah chapter 3. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. It's not the angel that rebukes Satan. It says, The Lord will rebuke thee. Which is why in Jude it says, The angel wouldn't even bring a railing accusation. The angel wouldn't even tell him off. 
The angel said, the Lord will tell you off. Okay? Again, angel and judgment. You can't worship angels because angels don't judge. And Jude goes through his epistle and gives example after example after example after example. And in Jude, he says, Michael, the archangel, said. It doesn't say which angel it was in Zechariah. Where did that come from? It came from one of our lost books, The Assumption of Moses, which no longer exists. And the only reason we know about it is because Origen and Clement of Alexandria referenced it and said they got that out of the book of The Assumption of Moses or sometimes called The, Testa the Testament of Moses. That book is lost. And we're just left with this fragment of it in the Bible. Too bad. But why Michael? Jude could have left that little bit out. But he didn't. Why didn't he leave Michael out? Who's Michael? He's the top angel. He's the highest angel that you can get in in any kind of writing. And not even the top angel is prepared to do any judging. So go and put that back. I'll just close with the doxology uh, of Jude because these are very, very beautiful words. I, I didn't want to go right through Jude and give you a verse by verse and that sort of stuff tonight. All I wanted to do was give you this background, this, his, this historical narrative, this historical information that now any time you open it up, you go, this is about angels and judgment. And in this section here, because it's now about angels and judgment, it must be this. Oh, the other one, I'll just say quickly, is one that we get stuck on is these angels that were bound in the earth and that sort of thing. I've got no problem with Jude. We, we, we sort of say, oh, that was um, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. I don't think it reads like that personally. But I believe that the writers of the book of Enoch use that as their inspiration. That's not a problem to me because he's still saying in that situation it's God that's going to judge them and it's, and it's God that put them down there. It wasn't the angels. All right? That's the point that he's making. So I'll just quickly finish with this doxology. Um, in Jude, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And there's actually two ways of reading this. You can read it as uh, verse 24 and 25 apply to God, or you can read it as verse 24 applies to Jesus and verse 25 applies to God. But now he finishes, and why does he finish it this way? Because he says, now unto him, the person who you can worship. We've looked at all these others that you can't, and now in my conclusion I'm going to say, now unto him who can save. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and ever. Amen.